All right, Acts 25. So you'll remember Paul is in Caesarea. He's like an arrested house guest of the, uh, the governor, if you will, Festus, who just took over from Felix. And Festus made this little trip as part of his change of command ceremony. And he went down to uh, Jerusalem and the high priest and stuff said, hey, why don't you just send Paul down here and we'll whack him? And he's like, yeah, I don't know, maybe not. And he goes back up to Caesarea. And then, lo, here comes King Agrippa and Bernice, his sister. Um, they show up to kind of welcome the new guy, uh, Festus, and say, hey, how you doing? And um, we kind of talked about them last week, Agrippa and Bernice. And so we're going to pick up today in Acts 25, verse 14. And when they, that's uh, Agrippa and Bernice, had been there, that's Caesarea, with house guest of Festus, many days, Festus declared Paul's case unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix. That's Paul. Felix didn't know what to do with him. He's trying to extort money from him. He couldn't get the money, and so he just kind of left him in jail, and then Festus kind of inherited him, if you will. Um, verse 15, About whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him, to whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. I've read this a couple times in in preparation for today, and it seems to me that he's being very detailed in the way he's describing exactly what happened to uh, Agrippa. And... I think it's because he feels guilty, and we're going to get to that here in a minute. Um, and, and I think it's the lie, and you know you know when somebody's lying to you, or like if somebody, a street hustler, comes up to you, and they tell you this big, long tale of woe about why they really need $5 from you, and they make up this long, really detailed, involved story, and it's like, dude, why don't you just say, hey, can I have five bucks? I'm out of gas. You know, but they don't, right? they they got to spin this big tale. And to me, it feels like he's spinning this big tale for Agrippa. Now, remember, Agrippa's a Jew. Right? And so Agrippa understands the Jews. Agrippa is a Jew, though, that has, is on the Roman side. Right? He's kind of switched over. But he understands Jews. And so uh, Festus is talking to him. So he gives him all this detail. And therefore, verse 17, when they were come hither, the people that wanted to accuse him, without any delay, on the morrow, see, so he's like, and right away I gave him this trial. It's like, that's kind of a weird detail to, to give to somebody. But he says, right away, um, without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the, verse 18, against whom, when the accuser stood up, they brought none accusation of such thing as I supposed. Verse 19, but I had, but had certain questions against him of their own. Now in King James, it says superstition and of one Yeshua, Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Who's got scriptures? Does it say superstition? Worship. Worship? See, that's closer. Or religion. He's not going to say these Jews of this superstition when he's talking to a Jew. Right? That's just, superstition is like, that's a loaded term. He's not going to, he's not going to say that. So worship, it's whatever, of this belief structure. Um, and one Jesus, Yeshua, which was dead, who Paul says is alive. And because I doubted such man, this is important, verse 20, because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. Because he didn't understand the questioning, the way it was going, because he doubted, you know, the, the efficacy of it, that's why he asked Paul to go to Jerusalem. Is that true? Remember when he asked Paul, he goes, hey, do you, you think we should go down to Jerusalem and... That's not why he asked Paul to go to Jerusalem. He asked Paul to go to Jerusalem so Paul would say yes and then he'd get whacked by the, you know, the Sicarii or the high priest hired hands and go, well, he volunteered to go. What, what could I do? You know, that's why he asked him to go. He didn't ask him to go to clear this whole matter up. 
that's the lie that he's kind of spinning all these details before and behind it. But verse 21, when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. So Augustus and Caesar are both titles. Do you guys know who, who was Caesar then? Anybody know? Is it in your Bible? It was Nero who fiddled while Rome burned, who had a huge prosecution against the Christians, but not yet. He hasn't started his persecution of the Christians yet. Nero hasn't. Um, but he is, in fact, the Caesar um, to which Paul is appealing. <clears throat> so he gives them his story. And then verse 22, Agrippa says unto Festus, I would also hear this man myself. Tomorrow, he said, thou shalt hear him. All right, so Agrippa says, I'd like to hear him. And then Festus says, okay, tomorrow uh, I'll arrange that for you. And on the morrow... When Agrippa was come, and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and the principal men of the city. Right there, verse 23. At Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. So they say with great pomp. So what happened was they had kind of a, what do they call it, a state dinner for King Agrippa and Bernice. And so they come in, and the musicians are playing, and then all the, the leaders of the city and everything kind of file in behind them. And so is this a trial that's fixing to happen under Agrippa? No, Agrippa doesn't have any, any power. It's just a show. It's entertainment. It's like, hey, here's something to do. You're here. You're a Jew. You know, maybe you'll understand what he has to say better than I do. But it's a spectacle that Paul is about to be the centerpiece of. I was thinking about that when I was going through this because I don't think I would react nearly as well as Paul to, to this being made a spectacle, but Paul's a better man than me. So, all right. So they come in with all the head people of the city. Paul's brought in, and Festus said, let's see, here's like the, the formal introduction uh, of the party. King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not live any longer. But when I found that he, he committed that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him. All right, he's just said he's done nothing worthy of death. He's, he's done nothing worthy of, of his level of um, taking care of this. So what should he have done with them? He should have let them go. He should have said, you know what? This is a waste of time. Dismissed. Case dismissed. Why didn't he do that? Because it wasn't his call. There's two reasons. It was his call. He could have done that. He could have let him go. One was to keep the Jews happy, right? He's trying to play both sides of the fence, and we talked about that earlier. The head Jews want to kill this guy. He's trying to maintain order, work with them to, you know, kind of make everybody happy. But I can't go against Roman law, which is kill an innocent Roman citizen. So that's the one reason that he hasn't let him go. The other reason is um, Matthew chapter 10. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Verse 18. Nope, that's not the one I'm looking for. 10.18 is you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake. I mean, that is one reason. That's not the reason, though. That's just the fact. Yeshua said that... Uh, his disciples, his apostles were going to be brought before kings and governors for his sake, and he was. Um, hold on. Well, it's in Matthew. No, it's not. It's in, it's in Acts. Hold on. Come back. There we go. Acts 23, verse 11. That's why he's not letting them go. Acts 23, Verse 11, and the night following, the master, Yeshua, stood next to him, Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for you have testified of me in Jerusalem, and now you must also bear witness at Rome. This is Yah's plan that he go to Rome. Now, I reckon he could have let Paul go, and then Paul would still go to Rome. I, I don't know, but he's definitely getting to Rome. That's where this whole thing is going to end up here. And so that's why he doesn't let him go. All right. 
So I have determined to send him to Caesar to Augustus. We're back in Acts 25, verse 26. Of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore, I have brought him forth before you, especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. It's like, all right, King Agrippa, I got a problem, man. I'm going to send this guy to Rome, to Caesar, and I don't really know what to write because I don't understand all this nonsense that those people who believe like you do are putting forth to me. And so maybe you can help a brother out and tell me what to write in my letter that I send him to Rome with. And so we're stopping there today for this part. Um, I was going to go somewhere else with it, but it's a little bit premature, so we're going to wait. We get to hear a great uh, speech from Paul uh, coming up probably next week, maybe, if we'll see it. Um, but the stage is set now for Paul, to, as one of the apostles, to be brought before governors and kings for the sake of Yeshua and to testify of Yeshua. And so, I'm totally switching gears on you now. Alright, so just go click, save that aside for a second. I, I brought up, I think it was two sermons ago, and, and I didn't know where it was, so I was actually looking it up. There's these billboards, and I think we're going to start seeing more of them, because people are predicting a summer of troubles, right? You know, whatever. Um, terrorism, politics, whatever. But if you guys could just turn to Second Chronicles chapter 7. All the way almost to the front of the book. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. So there's these billboards that I have seen, and then I've seen pictures of them also on the internet. And good meaning... Um, Christians bring up this comment a lot. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, reads in the King James, If my people, that's Yahweh, God, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Has anybody else seen that? That uh, billboard hanging up, but there was a lot of them on 40. What's the one that goes through Springfield? 44. All right, there was. They were on 44 is where I saw them. Um, and so people are like, look, this is all we have to do. We have to turn from our wicked ways. We have to pray to the Father, and He'll heal our land. Um, we're going to come back here, but right now I'd like to go to the half Torah portion for today, which is in Jeremiah. Chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, I don't think we're going to read the whole thing, but I want to read some of it, and then we're going to go back to Second Chronicles. Thus saith Yahweh of hosts. What is that? Yahweh Sabaoth? Is that Yahweh of hosts? The Lord of hosts? Is that Sabaoth? So, host is armies, right? It's the Lord of armies, Yahweh of armies. The Elohim of Israel. Here's what he said. Put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. He didn't speak to them until he gave them the law and spoke to them about it. But when he first brought them out, he didn't talk to them about that. But this thing commanded I them, saying, all right, look at this, verse 23 in Jeremiah chapter 7, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, your Elohim, and ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. So there's two things there he's telling the people to do. What is that? Obey. Obey is the first one, and walk. Obey and walk. Obey my voice, listen to what I said, and do what I said. Walk, walk as I have commanded you. But they hearken not, 
nor inclined their ear, but they walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backwards, not forwards. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets daily, rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore thou shalt speak all these words unto them, but they will not hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeys not the voice of, it says in King James, the Lord their God, Yahweh their Elohim, nor receives correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. And then bad things happen to Jerusalem as, as it goes forward. But this is a disobedient, woeful, not listening nation of Israel. That's what we read in Jeremiah. Now go back to Second Chronicles. I hope you left your finger there. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will from heaven, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So he said in the half Torah portion to hear my voice and, and walk in my ways. So listen to what I tell you and do what I tell you to do. And here he's saying, hey, if you do that in Second Chronicles, I'll heal your land and everything's going to be okay. And so we see this meme or this theme going on today um, throughout greater Christianity. But what people don't follow up with is verse 19 of Second Chronicles. So just Go down to verse 19. Because if you do these things, I'm going to heal your land. But, verse 19, if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land, and then it goes on and on and on, and all these bad things happen. See, so it's an if or but. You know, if you do this, good things happen. If you don't do this, bad things happen. And nobody ever reads the bad, the bad things. And I don't think we can truly understand the if people will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I don't think you can understand that until you read what he says. If you, but if you don't do these things, they're directly related. Keeping his commandments and um, not forsaking him and not going after other gods. Um, it seems to me, and, and Brother Justin has been giving me some things to think about. I'm not saying that Christians are serving other gods, um, because most of us, I think, came out of Christianity. Um, but there's a lot of mistakes being made where, you know, Easter and Christmas and all that. And Easter's on my mind because it, it's coming up tomorrow. Um, and they're doing these evil things, and they say in their own heart they know what it's for, but that's not what God wants. God wants our obedience, and, and he tells us what he wants. But then again, there's things I think that we're doing that are similar. Um, and they could actually be worse once we dig deeper into it and find out. But I have, I have been guilty of talking about people who cherry-pick verses. You can cherry pick any verse you want out of this. There's a huge book with a lot written in it. And you can go and say, you know, Judas went and hung himself. Go thou and do likewise. That's two verses. There, we'll make a doctrine out of that. All right? Now, that's a ridiculous example because it's a ridiculous point. But we have to be careful about what we say. And sometimes, and I may be, uh, we're, we're probably going to start a Bible study on this. Because um, I'm certainly not ready to preach on this yet. But we have we are guilty sometimes of taking a verse like um, maybe even 1 John 3, 4. What is sin? Sin is transgression of the law. And we kind of build a whole doctrine on that. And, and we kind of put our feet on that one verse. And have we actually gone into that and torn that apart and looked at that and said, you know, what was he actually, what's the context, Where, where's this lie within the, the body of what he's saying? And I haven't done that yet either. That's why I said I'm not ready to preach on it, but we need to look at it. And we need to be careful of the same things. It's always easy um, to point at the other people, to point out the disobedient Israelites or to point out the overzealous Pharisees or the non-believing Jews or whatever, the, the Christians who are celebrating Easter tomorrow. It's easy to do that. It's a lot harder to go, 
oh, hello, mirror. <laughs> you know, what are we doing? And so um, I'm just feeling, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's because I haven't been doing physical activity and I'm getting softer in the last week because of my back. But I think we need to embrace a little bit more. And I'm talking about this particular group right here. Um, a little bit more of the love of Yeshua. Because Yeshua showed great love. And we're really good about talking about how he was a hard guy and he judged hard and he said some really harsh things. And I'm chief amongst the people who did that. But he also showed amazing love um, for people. And he understood people, you know, because he's Yeshua, right to their soul, to their quick, just by looking at them and being in their presence. Um, and maybe we should try a little harder with the love aspect of it and kind of figure out where these people are and not be so prideful in where we think we are. Because we've all been wrong before. And I'm not saying we're wrong now, but I'm saying we don't have... All the truth now that we're gonna have as we go forward I mean I certainly hope not I hope you know there's more to learn and it's like all right I got it I'm done you know I, I, I don't need anything else what am I gonna read next um, somebody did make that comment and then I'm gonna finish up with that somebody said why do you have to read the Bible once you've read it why do you have to read it again I think they said that to mm -hmm. you on your Facebook mm -hmm. post and it's like wow how do you even begin to answer that question um, if you can take something away from today, I would just say, um, look at that mirror instead of looking at the end of your finger that you're pointing at other people and do a little bit of time with Yah and, and ask him to show us, me, you, our faults and our misunderstandings and point out where we're right and help us to feel a little bit more of the love of Yeshua uh, when we're dealing with other people. So that's the sermon for today. Let's pray.